Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Supreme Court for this event on the humanity of judging, uh, which is a sensitive subject for me because I'm a judge and I'm one of the justices of the Supreme Court. Uh, some of you have been able to look around this building, which was um, opened as a Supreme Court five years ago last month. It's all very new, as you've been able to see. It was before that, the Middlesex Sessions, but has been converted to provide us with three courts for the Supreme Court. And we were sitting in this very court this afternoon as seven judges deciding an issue about the statelessness. Um, now, this is part of the festival, of the Being Human Festival, which is the UK's first national festival of the humanities. And that's been taking part all this week across the UK. Um, the being, being Human is led by the School of Advanced Study of the University of London in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. And this particular event is sort of focusing on the law and uh, the extent to which um, judges bring their humanity to the decisions they make and how that affects them and how it should affect them and what sort of issues that gives rise to. So I'm particularly interested, as I said, to find out myself what people think about us and how they um, feel we should be dealing with these issues. Um, now, before we carry on with our distinguished speakers, a few words of thanks. Um, we've had some student volunteers who've helped in the practical arrangements, grateful to them. The Judith Townend, who was the director of the recently launched Center for Law and Information Policy, um, has been the, the, the sort of main brains behind the event. She's sitting over there. And we're very grateful for the work she's put into it. And she's worked in cooperation with the Supreme Court. Um, now, we have four panelists. The idea is that each of them will speak for um, not more than 10 minutes. Uh, and I'll introduce each of them as we go along. And then that should leave us some time for some questions or discussion with the audience. And um, we, we plan to wrap up sharply at 8.15. I should perhaps just make clear that this event is being broadcast live over the web via our Supreme Court website. You may be aware that we actually, our hearings are are available to see on our website on in real time on television. And this event is being dealt with in, in the same way. Um, we are hoping that a recording can be made available on our U YouTube channel later date. And those who want to tweet the hashtag to share observations as the event unfolds is uh, hash being human 14. Um, so, with that out of the way, I will invite each of our speakers. We've got um, Alexander Marks, who's a recorder and a Deputy High Court judge, um, who will speak on her exp own experience as a lawyer and judge. We've got Dr. Lawrence uh, McNamara, uh, who is the Deputy Director and Senior Research Fellow at the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, who will tell us a bit about interviews he conducted with serving judges who had tried terrorism cases. We have Professor Leslie Moran, who is the Principal Investigator, Judicial Images Network at the School of Law Birkbeck, who will speak how, on how judges are represented in official portraits and other images. And finally, Professor Erica Rackley, who is a Professor of Law at Birmingham Law School, who will speak on how judges' humanity is reflected in their work and the possible implications for debates on judicial diversity. So um, we start off then with Alexander Marx, who's on my right. She has a distinguished record. She was a solicitor for 27 years with Linklaters as a partner. She retired in 2011. She sits as a recorder, criminal and civil, and as a High Court Deputy Queen's Bench uh, judge. And she has also been uh, as a commissioner and is a commissioner for the Judicial Appointments Commission. And apart from the other professional engagements, she was chair of Amnesty International Charity 
for 10 years and as an executive member of Justice for 15 years. So I will hand over to her to speak about the humanity of judging. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. I'm really thrilled to be here and to see so many of you here. I think it's an absolutely uh, fascinating uh, topic and uh, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. When I accepted this invitation, I had no idea who my fellow panellists would be. Um, but when I discovered that they were all academics, I felt slightly intimidated and thought that actually the way I would distinguish what I'm going to say from anything that they might uh, was to give you some uh, first-hand insights um, from someone who is actually a judge, as it were, on the front line. Apart from our distinguished chair, I'm the only member of the uh, panel who has sat in that capacity. So I thought you might find it interesting what it's really like. Uh, not because I think that anything I do is either particularly special or indeed necessarily uh, typical, uh, but because I think my background uh, means that I have not shared the experience of most judges of having uh, spent my professional life in and out of court. Uh, as a solicitor in commercial practice, in fact, I'd never stepped foot in a courtroom as a professional person until I became a part-time judge myself, which is rather extraordinary, but means that everything that I experienced was almost as a lay person uh, coming to sit on the bench, and that was a rather startling one for reasons I will explain shortly. Uh, but the second is that uh, even though I have now been doing it for 12 years, because I do it only very part-time, three to six weeks a year, I don't think that I have become immune uh, to the oddity of uh, sitting as a judge, and it strikes me every time I do it quite what a, a peculiar um, uh, experience it is. Um, and again, uh, because I come back to real life every time I've done it, um, I am struck by the extraordinary experiences and the stories, and I want to uh, share some of them with you. Uh, the first thing was that when I came to uh, the court as a part-time judge, as a recorder, and for those of you who don't know, uh, that is a part-time circuit judge, and because I sit in crime, that meant that I was judging criminal trials, jury trials, of which I had no professional experience at all. Uh, as a solicitor, I bought and sold office blocks, shopping centres and the like, and so it was a bit of a shock uh, to find myself uh, dealing with the seamy side of human life. Um, the first thing that uh, might surprise you is that it's actually an incredibly scary thing to do. I was petrified when I first went into court uh, and realised that everyone was expecting me to take charge of the proceedings. Um, there were these moments where the room went quiet and everyone looked at me and I thought, I'm obviously supposed to do something, but I don't really know what it is. <laughs> um, I was also very struck by the awesome responsibility of um, managing a trial which was of immense importance to everybody involved in it, not just the defendant, although perhaps him as it usually was, or occasionally her, uh, most obviously, but all the witnesses, the jurors, and to a lesser extent, uh, the professionals, uh, the barristers, and of course, uh, the court staff. And there were a number of very striking experiences. One was the eye-opening, um, direct, first-hand experience of the immense poverty uh, that there is in our country. I was really shocked, having lived a really extremely privileged life, uh, I recognise, as a professional person, living in a nice house in central London, working in the city, very civilised surroundings with sophisticated, civilised, well-educated, articulate people who tended to treat each other uh, pretty well. And then moving to the uh, Crown Court, where all of human life is there in its various uh, forms, and that was pretty eye-opening. Uh, the sensation was not unlike Alice Through the Looking Glass, where I felt as though I had stepped into a parallel universe, where all these things were going on around me and I had never really noticed before. And it's had a really profound effect on me uh, ever since. Um, I look at people uh, differently now. There's no uh, doubt about it. Uh, the other um, really uh, striking thing about it was that 
I had no idea really of what the reality would be like beyond, and you may find this rather funny, uh, the sort of court dramas you see on television. Of course, it's not like that at all. Uh, there are occasionally moments of humour and Rumpole of the Bailey type um, uh, episodes. Uh, but on the whole, actually, I found it really a very uh, serious, um, quite difficult intellectually, um, and on occasion, really quite upsetting uh, experience. And that's where I want to talk about the humanity aspect. There are two cases that stick particularly in my mind, and they were only very brief ones, because in both cases, uh, the defendants had actually uh, pleaded guilty. So all that was required of me was to uh, deliver the necessary sentence. But I found both of them uh, profoundly upsetting experiences, and I'll tell you why. Um, the first was a young woman who was a hairdresser, nice girl, uh, she had glowing references from her clients. But on an evening out with the girls, um, which she treated herself to once a month as a young single mother, she had become extremely drunk and uh, involved in a couple of men were fighting outside a nightclub. And she tried in her drunken state to separate them. And uh, it all turned rather nasty. And her brother came to rescue her and felled one of the men with one punch. Once he was on the ground, she kicked him uh, in the head. She was obviously uh, very drunk, but upset that he had been quite so rude to her. And he suffered a quite serious brain injury as a result. There was absolutely no doubt. Unfortunately, I realised from reading the cases, uh, there weren't guidelines uh, at that time, there are now, that I was going to have to send this girl to prison. And it was a very, very uh, difficult experience. I feel choked even talking about it because I was so upset by it. And I knew that she would be and that I was going to have to explain very, very clearly why I was doing it. And I did. And I realised that uh, she was going to be separated from her young child. And as a single mother, that was clearly going to be a very difficult experience. And as she wept in the dock, I nearly did too. And... I thought, as the judge, you just can't do that. I had a very interesting conversation with my husband when I was telling him that I was going to be speaking at this event and telling that story. And he said, and why can't you cry? And I said, well, as the judge, I really don't think you can to preserve the dignity of the office and for people to take you seriously. I just don't think you, you can. But I was really very, very upset about it. There was another case, actually, which also... Uh, I think it was the only other case I've ever dealt with, with a female defendant. And it was a 13-year-old girl who had, uh, again, pleaded guilty to a string of really quite serious offences, including threatening someone with a knife, robbery, assaulting a police officer, criminal damage, that sort of thing. Um, it transpired that actually she had committed these offences uh, while high on heroin, which had been provided by her father as a reward for looking after him. And uh, she was actually quite a bright girl, but desperately trying to hold her family together, which was extremely dysfunctional. Her mother, unsurprisingly in the circumstances, had found it difficult to cope with her and to put her into care, from which she kept absconding. And I realised again that there was really no alternative but to um, uh, pass a custodial sentence of some description on this young girl. And again, I felt so incredibly emotional about it because at that time she was about the same age as my own daughters and I realised what a terrible experience uh, her life had been uh, compared with uh, the really rather, uh, I hope, wonderful and privileged lives that my own daughters uh, led. And it made me question uh, how we bring as uh, judges our emotions or how we keep in check our emotions um, in the courtroom. And I think it's, it's both good and bad. On the one hand, I think that that is what the humanity of judging that we're here to discuss is about, that you understand uh, the significance of what you're doing and the emotions that are likely to be experienced uh, by those who come before you, either as defendants or witnesses or indeed uh, family members. Uh, but I also think that it's important to understand why it is that people feel very intimidated by the setting, very alienated by the language, uh, not understanding uh, what is going on. And that, I think, is a perspective which I feel that I have been able to uh, bring uh, through the rather unusual uh, 
um, experience uh, that I have. There is so much more that I could say on this topic, which I find a fascinating one, but I think I'm going to stop there, and I very much look forward to the questions and discussions later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra. I think it will be very interesting to hear a few more of those really upsetting accounts and how people respond to that sort of problem. Uh, but we'll move on now to Lawrence McNamara, who, as I said, is a senior research fellow at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. But before that, he was reader in law at the University of Reading um, and has held academic posts in Australia before that. But I think of direct relevance to what he's going to be talking about this evening is uh, some work he did uh, as a, a research program called Law, Terrorism and the Right to Know, in the course of which he conducted around 60 confidential interviews with lawyers, journalists, government officials, police and the judiciary, uh, and um, including, I think, 15 interviews with judges who presided over terrorism trials. So, Lawrence, over to you. Thank you. Um, I want to start by putting the, the comments in context and to do so in a way that I don't think I've ever done before, which is to dedicate them to the memory of a woman named Kelly Healy. Uh, I never met Kelly Healy. Um, had she not died at the age of 23, though, she would have turned 50 this week. It's about 20 years ago that I first read about her in a case called The Crown Against Royale. And she died. It was a, a murder case. And she died in what the court described as uh, variously as a, a domestic melee, and they had a relationship, it was said, that was far from serene. And the factual issue was she was locked in the bathroom after a terrible, terrible, brutal fight in the lounge. And the question was, was she pushed out the window? Did she fall while she was escaping the blows of the partner? Did she jump in fear? Or did she commit suicide and jump out the window that way? And the consequence in law was murder, manslaughter, or acquittal. And this gruesome factual scenario, there's blood on every surface of the flat. This was not discussed in the judgment other than to analyze the legal issues. And this, this has troubled me for 20 years. It troubled me then and it still does because the, the unimaginable terror of what went on in the bathroom was unremarkable in the sense that it didn't warrant being remarked upon. And I'm not saying that our judges should pay special attention to a victim or to an accused or to a tragedy, because we want our judges to be fair and impartial. We want our institutions like that. But we don't want them to ignore the humanity and the tragedy that so often accompanies the legal process. And I think we want to know about that humanity. We want to know what's there. And it's very difficult in an environment that doesn't lend itself to that, as Alexandra has just explained. And the context, I think, in which it sits, which follows perfectly from what's said, is that the humanity of judging needs to be seen against the enormity of judging. They, judges are just making such profound decisions. And in the criminal context, it's obvious. But in the, even in tort law, in the law of negligence, that's about the duty of care you owe to what the court calls your neighbor. In 1932, you have a, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the Good Samaritan who helps the bleeding stranger. And the judges are making decisions about who we owe a duty to, but also who you can leave bleeding in the street or in their stairwell or in their house with no fear of legal consequences. So my encounters with judges have been very limited until the last couple of years. My, I'd barely met a lawyer until I was in my mid-twenties, and I'd never met a judge till I was 30. My first encounter was a judge who came to speak to a group of students where I worked at a university. Uh, and he told a story about another judge which was intended to amuse them, which he found amusing. It's probably apocryphal, but it was told as real. And the story was told was about a rape victim that was giving evidence, explaining the details of what had happened during the rape. And the judge makes a comment to the victim, intended as amusement for the court, and that made light of the details of the rape. It was plainly humiliating, but this judge recounted this without any insight into how anyone would see this. And so knowing this is being recorded, I will offer my sort of measured thoughts that I don't think probably reveal the true extent of my feelings about that incident. 
It was the most appallingly stunning and repellent piece of behaviour and an absolute disgrace that I hope I never see again. It was just profoundly hideous. So they're my laid back remarks about that. <laughs> I then went and I spoke to judges in this country in the last couple of years. I wanted to know what is it that isn't in the judgments. It took me a 10 month process to get approval and I met with these judges and spoke to them. I can tell you what they told me, but I've got to remember I'm both an insider and an outsider. I'm talking about terrorism cases, I'm white and I'm not Muslim. I don't know if it matters, but I, I think it must somehow to the conversations we had. I'm an academic. There is a measure of respect accorded me, even to the point where I got to talk to them. I'm an outsider, though. I'm not British. As soon as I open my mouth, that becomes patently apparent. Um, and I'm not an Oxbridge background. And I can say I did not have a single point of social connection with anyone I spoke to in that entire process. There was never an exchange of, oh, well, you obviously know X. <laughs> no. I obviously don't. Judges spoke frankly to me, and they reflected on the perception of the judiciary, that it's changed in a generation. And they've gone from protecting the establishment to, in the eyes of the establishment, as they said, being the villains of the peace. And that the public trust in the judiciary increases in some ways as the public trust in possibly parliament and the executive decreases. Judges told me they were not influenced by the media. I don't care what the red tops say, said one of them. And they do care about what the public rightly expect of courts, especially in delivering sentences. And they do care about the media. They don't care what the media thinks, but they care about what the public thinks. But they care about the media and they follow it because that's a responsibility of a judge to follow that, to understand what's going on. They don't think that they should be providing information to the media. That's the role of the government, of the prosecution. There should be open justice and public justice. But the courts are umpires. They are not players. They are watching the boxing match, as one of them put it, refereeing it rather than punching. Do judges create a judgment for media consumption or for public consumption? And I discussed this with them at length. The answer is yes. The decision to choose one word or another, um, especially with the knowledge or the intention that it's going to appear in the media and for the public, that matters to them. Do they admit it? The answers tended to be, any of them said, yes, of course, when I write a sentencing remarks, I'm aware of that it's going to appear in the media. And right through to, yes, you bet I'm aware. I give them a written copy to make sure they won't get it wrong and to make sure they'll get it. The others said, well, you know, I don't, of course, but others do. And my favourite response was the words of Francis Urquhart, where one judge said to me, well, you might say that, but I couldn't possibly comment. The, the crafting of statements is not irresponsible. It's not about attention-seeking. It's because they want people to understand, and not just in a superficial way. They really want people to understand what's going on. And so some of them wouldn't give their sentencing remarks to journalists because they said they're just going to leave. I want these people to understand what's happening. And then the public matters to them, but only to a point because as one judge said, if you're going to have a choice between letting some poor bugger know how many years he's getting or letting someone have a nice note and take the trouble of noting the details of my sentencing, the defendant wins every time. Judges are conscious of, and this again to the enormity of it, of what their decisions might mean. And one of them said to me, it's never happened yet, thank God, but if I granted bail to a terrorist and he's gone and bombed something, when that happens, not if, but when it happens, the media will be at my front door. And this is, as will so lots of other people, but they don't like the media that much. As one of them said, um, the, the, quite healthily, the only story they like about judges is that they're old fools, deaf, corrupt, or they don't know what's going on. Judges, in the end, in my conversation, were reassuringly ordinary. Some were charming, some were not. Um, some of them used their freedom pass on the bus and felt a bit guilty about it because they were employed. 
I can say across the board, there is a superb cup of tea made by the English judiciary. <laughs> it is fabulous. Um, but most of all, there's a humanity that is imbued with responsibility, but the institutional role doesn't permit it to come out. And in closing, I'll come back to, to Kelly Healy, who I did had a bit of a flick through some stuff this week to try and find what happened to Kim Royale, who um, was convicted, or any more information about her. And some of the evidence in the case was that in the two days before she died, she said to um, her partner over the phone, don't speak to me like that, speak to me like a human being. And I think, well, nobody can speak to Kelly Healy anymore, but we can speak about her. And I think while it's not always visible from the judgments and the enormity of the task of judging can obscure it, I think examining the humanity of judging is part of the way we can speak about her. And one of the things that strikes me as I read then back through the case in Royale is that the absence of the, the acknowledgement of the terror does not mean there was an absence of humanity in the judgments. But it's a very difficult thing, I think, sometimes as you read what judges do and, and look at the distance that's there. And I think this is a great sort of session to, to start to expose some of that humanity. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for that interesting perspective. Um, but we now move to something rather different, which is Leslie Moran talking um, about the way judges are portrayed. Um, he, as I said, was professor of law um, at the School of Law Birkbeck, uh, and he joined that school in April 1998 and was head of the law school from 2002 to 2005, and has been involved in various organizations. Um, and he's served as a member of the Law Society's Equality and Diversity Committee from 2006 to 2013. Um, and has been involved with the Committee of Interlaw Diversity for the LGBT Networks. But anyway, over to you on the how we look. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, let me begin by introducing you to two photographic portraits. Uh, they are of uh, Nicholas Addison Phillips. They're on the screen here and on the uh, handout that you have in front of you. And he's appearing here as Lord Phillips, Chief Justice. He held that post uh, between 2005 and 2008. In my presentation tonight, I want to use these and a small selection of other portraits to explore the humanity of judging. And I think it resonates quite nicely with the uh, two presentations that we've heard already. Why focus on images and why portraits? Scholarship suggests that the self-image is sent a central preoccupation of the judiciary. Why? Judges, like other social elites, are acutely aware of their own image and the need to manage that image. Through their self-image, judges explore, define, and legitimate their role and their elite position in society. Who are these images produced for? We've just been hearing a little bit about that. First of all, I would suggest that these images are produced for the judges themselves, for the wider legal community, and for those appearing before the courts. Uh, Lawrence has just been suggested that they may also be produced for the public in certain contexts. So the public is another audience in mind. Judicial images take various forms using various media, from the live performance that Alexandra was talking about to the written text of the judgment or the sentencing comments that may or may not be written and distributed. But it also includes visual images, including portraits. So why focus on portraits? Well, portraits seek to capture and represent the essence of the subject of the portrait. Judicial portraiture, however, is a very particular type of portrait with special and particular characteristics. These two portraits before you are examples of what are called state portraits. They are double portraits depicting the individual and the institution. The individual is represented as the embodiment of the values and virtues of the institution. 
These portraits are dominated by symbols that depict the values and virtues of the institution. They often take this, these particular forms, half body or full body portraits. Most of the surface of the image is dominated by the symbols of the institution. The face, which may individualize a subject, takes up a relatively small part of the image and is relatively insignificant. We've moved here to a very different picture. It shows Lord Phillips again, this time with his grandson, sharing an intimate moment, wearing matchual, matching casual shirts. In an interview with Lord Phillips, he explained the appearance of this portrait, which was uh, on the judicial website between 2007 and 2008. He explained, and I quote, we were invited to provide a photograph for the website. So I thought I would choose a photograph that would show me as an ordinary person and not one of someone wearing a wig. Most judges in their photograph, if their photograph is to be seen by a member of the public, will prefer to be seen in their ordinary costume and not in some sort of disguise. In response to that, I asked him the following question. You don't think that the symbols of the wig, the robe, the ermine trim have significance for people now? And his response was, well, they probably do. But it depends on what message you want to get across. Most judges would not want to get across a message, how grand I am, but to get across a more personal impression. He explained, judges are in fact ordinary, albeit intelligent members of society doing a job. I invite you to look again at this portrait of Lord Phillips. It's probably come from a family album, but it's moved from that family album to the official website of the judiciary. And in that movement, it's transformed in its nature and its meaning. Despite the intimacy of the scale and the composition of this portrait that represents, it represents Lord Phillips as the embodiment of the virtues of the institution of the Lord Chief Justice. The symbols used to depict the values and virtues of the institution are the casual shirt, not the scarlet robe, the caring pose, not the ermine collar, the smiling, relaxed face. As Lord Phillips has explained, he chose the picture because of its potential to represent the virtues of being ordinary, intelligent, a member of society, as the important characteristics of judicial office holders. It's not that I'm preoccupied with Lord Phillips, but here he is again. <laughs> In this portrait, Lord Phillips is depicted as the first president of the UK Supreme Court. This picture accompanied his biographical note on the court's website. It's a little bit more formal than the last portrait, but still resorts to a format the head and shoulders composition long associated with informality and intimacy. The costume worn shows none of the archaic aristocratic symbols of authority, the scarlet robe, the golden chain that dominated the first two portraits that I showed you. The plain background and the lack of props help to ensure that nothing distracts us from the face. Now the face dominates the surface of the image. The face, not the body, now has to do much of the work of representing the values and virtues of the institution. It's also a composition that fits the cliche, the face is the window to the soul. The soul of the judge, looking at this image, has become much more important as a way of representing the virtues of the institution. Here we see Lord Phillips gazing into the camera. His gaze stares out at us, the viewer, and captures our gaze and invites the viewer to contemplate the face that is so important in expressing the values of the institution. Two points about the compositional style. It's a compositional style that gained importance after the French Revolution in portraits of the bourgeois elite, 
who rejected the use of aristocratic symbols to represent their status in society. Secondly, it's a composition that owes much to the mugshot or the passport photograph. It's a form of forensic photography that individualizes the subject and it resorts to an aesthetic of less is more. And as an official image of the judge, it seeks to express the values, I'd suggest, of flatter hierarchies, of the humanity of the judge, of the importance of the individual as virtues of the institution. My next image is really about the composite that you see on the right-hand side. Here I've gathered together all the portraits of the current justices of the UK Supreme Court as they are depicted on the court's website. The portrait on the left of Lloyd Norberger, the current president, I think indicates where some of these images have come from. They're a sort of cut-down version of other images, focusing primarily on the head and shoulders. When I first did the exercise of putting all the portraits of the judges of the court together, one thing struck me. They all look the same. The individuality that seems to be so apparent when you focus on one image, the last one that I showed you of Lord Phillips, seems to disappear when you put them together. The background is the same, the composition of the shot is the same, the importance of the face is similar in each and every one. Yes, there are subtle distinctions, but I had the overwhelming perception that they're all the same. I interviewed the first head of communications of the court, and I asked her about this experience that I had. And she gave me the following explanation about these particular shots. The first explanation was that these shots were primarily for identification. My response to that was that this was rather ironic. They all seemed to look the same. How could these be identification pictures? But having said that, I think this draws upon that forensic tradition of the mugshot. The second point that Sean Lewis made was uh, in response to a suggestion. My suggestion was that each judge should be invited to submit their own personal photograph, and this will be uploaded onto the website. In response to that, she made the following comment. We wanted it to be professional. The trouble with your suggestion is that you don't know what you're going to get. You can't trust judges. We also want it to be fairly uniform so that it showed that it's a sort of new, it's all brand new. This is an opportunity to show that it is a cohesive court rather than individuals. So I thought that was interesting because it seemed to take out the individual that you might expect to be um, profiled or raised in terms of looking at each individual shot. So each individual shot is also an image of the institution. And this is demonstrated most clearly when all the pictures are put together. My last point is perhaps about the present, if not the future. And it's a very different uh, experience, I think, of judicial portraiture. We have two images here. Both are screenshots from moving images, television images. Shortly after the opening of the Supreme Court, it was possible to watch live broadcasts, as we heard earlier, of the UK Supreme Court proceedings. From January 2013, you were able to watch judges of the Supreme Court delivering judgments on demand via YouTube. You could watch them over and over and over again <laughs> should you enjoy such an experience. In the top uh, left-hand corner, there's a, a screenshot of Lord Walker delivering the judgment in Crown and Weyer. One thing that strikes me about looking at these moving images of judges is how much more information you get about the judge. I'm always astonished to hear the voice of the judge, to hear the accent of the judge, to hear the social class ringing out through the voice of the judge, which is something that you don't get in the fixed image. I'm also fascinated by judicial hairstyles and how they change from judgment to judgment. I'm also intrigued by the body movements, the body ticks, who chews on the biro, 
whose hand moves irregularly across the judgment as the other judge is speaking. So a vast extra amount of information is available to us now through these televisual images. The second and my last image is of Judge Lord Brackendale from the Scottish courts. And it's a video of the first broadcast of a sentencing decision, going back to Alexandra's point. And I think what's fascinating is the position of the camera. It's on the bench. We, the viewing public, are on the bench observing the face of the judge, and we can observe it in minute detail. We can watch emotions flitter across the face, and it gives us a unique and, I think, challenging position for the judiciary to have that level of scrutiny. And I think this is where we're heading towards in the future, the television, the televising of judicial activity. So I've tried to draw attention to some common denominators to talk about some changes that perhaps raise the profile of the humanity of the judge and make that a virtue of the institution. And I would just like to finish by drawing attention to the work of the Supreme Court around the image of the judge. This court has undertaken some pioneering activity and has I think, transformed the image of the judge for us and made it, that image much more accessible to the public if the public wishes to view it. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I'm slightly worried now about who's looking at us and what they're making of us, but I'll be very interested to get your thoughts on that in a moment. But first of all, we have the last speaker, who is Erica Rackley, professor at Birmingham Law School, and her research interests fall within the broad field of gender and law, and with particular emphasis on gender diversity and equality in the legal profession and judiciary. And she's uh, written on that, appeared on the television and radio, and she also won the Society of Legal Scholars Peter Burke's Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholarship for her monograph, Women Judging and the Judiciary, in 2012. So over to you, Erica. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And also, I'd like to add... Ooh. There had to be one person that forgot to switch on the microphone, and it was me. Sorry. Um, thank you. I was thanking for the introduction, and thank you, Judith, for organising such an interesting um, event. What I thought I'd do was to try and sort of round off this, tonight's panel by thinking about where this takes us, what flows from the humanity of judging, and in particular, what it says about diversity and what it says about why it matters who our judges are. And I will start where Les finished with the, the images that sort of topped and tailed his um, slides of the, what I sometimes describe as the default image of the judge, the judge who immediately comes to mind when, when we think of a judge who is most likely to be um, bewigged and berobed um, in some sense. And I think this is the reason why the, the image of Lord Phillips and his grandson is, is so, so arresting. Or, Anonymous, authoritative, impartial, otherworldly. These are general things that perhaps we might think of or characteristics we might associate with a judge. Henry Cecil made this point when he had his newly appointed Mr Justice Thursby remark that one shouldn't be able to imagine a judge taking a bath. <laughs> In fact, on tonight's evidence, but not only on tonight's evidence, but on tonight's evidence, I think these days we're more likely to respond in the manner of his wife, who said, darling, I hope you won't take yourself too seriously. I think that most people realise there's a human being under all that clutter. <laughs> and certainly, as, as Les has noted, that one of the consequences of their judges, or at least their advisers, becoming more image conscious is the proliferation of opportunities to see the human side of the judiciary. A good example of this was the BBC4 documentary a few years ago where, amongst other things, we were able to see Lord Hope on the tube and in Sainsbury's, Lord Phillips cycling to work, and Lord Kerr making a boiled egg for his wife for breakfast. Even more recently, Ian McEwen, in an article published in The Guardian, referred to the former Court of Appeal judge, Sir Alan Ward, taking a trip to a football match with a young boy and his father. Nothing unusual there, perhaps, except for the fact that the boy had previously been the subject of a court hearing following his refusal, supported by his parents, of a life-saving blood transfusion. 
But while we may be comfortable with the human judge when they are off duty, when they are making breakfast, attending football matches, having a bath, these things might be a little different when they are on duty, when humanity collides with judgment. Dispassionate judges may, in the words of one Supreme Court justice, be mythical beings like Santa Claus, Uncle Sam, or Easter bunnies, but that doesn't mean we have to be happy with that state of affairs. Of course, this may be a matter of degree. The joy of Twitter meant that a headline from Australia in the Sydney Morning Herald back in September caught my eye. It read, female judge asked to disqualify herself due to suspected feminist and leftist views. <laughs> On further reading, it became clear that there was in fact no actual evidence for this suspicion. It stemmed entirely from the fact that the judge was a woman and as such, by definition, a feminist with leftist views. <laughs> the claimant, described as a serial litigant, feared he would not receive a fair hearing before a woman judge because he was well known for his critical views of feminism, including arguing for the barring of women from senior roles in society. He feared that this might cause the woman judge, in his words, to react, retaliate against me for directly threatening their jobs, income, material benefit, and their status. Rejecting his application, Justice Monica Schmidt of the Supreme Court of New South Wales commented, as human, as, human be as human beings, all judges hold personal views on a wide range of matters. By their oath of office, they are obliged to determine issues lying between parties who come before them in a myriad of cases impartially, even when their personal views do not accord with those expressed by one or other or even all of the parties. She continues that even if the judge had held the views the claimant feared, it did not follow that he or she would not determine what was an issue between the parties and the proceedings fairly and impartially. So what role do and should the views, experience, background of the judge play in their decision making? On one view, the response is easy. We want these things to play as little role as possible. In fact, ideally, we rather, might rather that these things played no role at all. We might perhaps not like the idea of justice being dispensed by Mrs Justice X to, di to differ from Mr Justice Y. We certainly don't want our judges to be activists. We don't want them to promote their political agendas. We want them to do their job and apply the law. The difficulty is that this understanding of judging has too gone the way of the Easter Bunny and other fairy tales. It was Lord Reed who back in the early 70s commented that there was a time when it, thought, it was thought almost indecent to suggest that judges made law, they only declared it. Those with a taste for fairy tales seem to have thought that there was in some Aladdin's cave hidden the common law in all its splendor and that a judge's, on a judge's appointment there descends upon him knowledge of the magic words open sesame. But we do not believe in fairy tales anymore. And so while of course we can all agree that we want our judges to take their judicial responsibilities seriously, Judges, especially in the, at the highest levels, are often called, to make upon, called upon to make decisions where the existing legal rules provide no clear answer. In such cases, the judge must turn to their own sense of justice, of what is right or wrong, to decide the case. And this will inevitably differ from judge to judge. Since we do not all share the same views, and even where we do, we <coughs> might prioritise and balance them differently, who the judge is will determine both the way they set about making their decision and the conclusion they reach. This isn't controversial. Judges often disagree, and not simply on what the authorities say, but on the direction the law should take. The question then becomes what informs the judges' values, their sense of justice, their views of what is right or wrong. The answer must, I think, at least be in part their background and experiences, which are in turn, to a large extent, shaped by personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, and so on. None of this is to, to suggest that there is a male way of judging, that all male judges judge in the same way or decide the case the same. Nor is it to suggest that the fact that judges a man is the only thing that impacts upon his judgment. It is to say, however, that it matters who our judges are. The humanity, or more simply who the judge is, makes a difference to judgment. I said at the outset that I'd say something about why this matters to the judiciary as a whole, and particularly why they are representative of the society they serve. According to the most recent statistics, just under three in four of the judiciary overall is male, and around 19 in 20, where ethnicity is known, are white. Of the 47 European Council member states, only Armenia and Azerbaijan have fewer women professional judges. 
In the senior judiciary, that's the High Court and above, the figures get even worse, and we're still able to point literally two single figures to the one woman in the Supreme Court, to the one BME judge in the High Court, the one former solicitor. And there are no BME or non-barrister judges in the UK Supreme Court, UK Supreme Court or Court of Appeal. Of course, these are not the only measures of diversity, in, but other official, uh, official, official figures on characteristics are even harder to find. There are a number of reasons why this is problematic and a number of even more explanations for why and how we might remedy it. And these were most recently set out by Karen Monaghan and Sir Geoffrey Byman in their ex excellent Accelerating Change report on judicial diversity for the Labour Party. I'll offer just one response which relates to the humanity of judging. If we accept that the law doesn't exist as a body of rules which settles conclusively the outcome of a case and that on occasions judges must fall back um, must decide what the law should be and how it should be developed, and so at times necessarily fall back on their own sense of justice and morality, which are then in turn informed and shaped by the insights um, of their backgrounds and experience and so on, then it matters who the judges are. It follows from this that there's a gain in having more varied and informed judges for the more varied body of the collective body and not of knowledge and wisdom the individual judge or the judiciary as a whole is able to draw on when making their decisions, the better their decisions will be. Well, why might we think this? Fortunately, you don't need to take my word for it. I can refer to a more authoritative source. And my, one reason is that judges themselves have told us. Lady Hale recently put it like this. I can think of a few judgments where my experience and perceptions of life made a difference to my view of the law. Often, but not always, a view which my brethren were then persuaded, though not necessarily by me, to share. Even if we, that's women judges, do not persuade our colleagues to share our point of view, it's important that we articulate it. And this is why the humanity of judges and the judiciary as a whole matters. It matters because a diverse judiciary is a better judiciary. It matters not just because it's more representative and democratically legitimate, although it is. It matters because it would be better positioned to do its job, to do justice. Thank you. Um, I'm quite interesting, actually, that none of, none of you have mentioned the Pistorius trial, where I thought one of the very impressive images was of this black woman judge in South Africa. Uh, you know, whatever you thought about the actual decision, I thought she made an extraordinarily dignified picture, and I thought it was really a, a, a very impressive image of how far South Africa has come in a relatively short time. Um, and you know, I, I was really rather proud of that that they had achieved that in that way. Um, but anyway, at that point, I I should thank our four speakers for their very helpful and very interesting contributions. Thank you for coming. Um, now, I've got one or two notes I've got, got to remind you of. Um, oh, yes. The uh, panel is an evaluation form, uh, which we would be grateful for you to fill in. And the incentive of doing that is that your completed forms will be entered into a draw to win a £100 Amazon voucher. So fill in your form, put it in the box at the back, and you might win a £100 Amazon voucher. Not quite sure how, how it's judged, but that's dealt with by Ben at the back. Um, so anyway, thank you. A round of applause for our speakers, and thank you very much.